Well, uh, hopefully uh, you've got your Bibles open to Romans 6. If you do not have a Bible, uh, I didn't see Samuel here. Oh, there's Samuel. Thank you, Sam. He's already on it. If you don't have a Bible, if you'd slip your hand up and Samuel will get a Bible to you. Uh, I believe it's very important you have a copy of God's Word as we read and study. And if you don't have a Bible or don't have access or some way to get a Bible, please let our church know. It would be a real honor for us to present you with a copy of God's Word, a study Bible that you can take home during the week and uh, study and learn and be conformed more and more to the image of His Son, Jesus. So, Samuel, I don't see any hands that are up, so thank you very much, Samuel, for your willingness every Sunday to, to serve in that capacity. I do appreciate it very much. Romans 6. Last week, uh, we looked at, we've been going through the book of Romans, and last week we looked at Romans 6, 1 through 14, and it talked about our new life. Who's, who's glad you got new life? Amen? Amen. Amen. That old life, good riddance, huh? Dead and buried and, arrived, and alive again. You missed it last week, Wendy. I was going to call it the zombie chapter, but... My wife said, I don't think I'd call it the zombie chapter. Dead, buried, and alive again. Praise God. And so last week we looked at our new life. And in this new life, and this new citizenship, I don't see Terry here today. Uh, Terry, many of you know Terry and Anna. Terry uh, got his U.S. citizenship, I guess about, I don't know, four or five months ago. And he came in today and was happy and excited. And, uh, you, you know, hey, I'm a, I'm a U.S. citizen now. And he was excited about that. And... Uh, Anyway, I, I always ask Canadians, when did we give you your freedom again? I don't remember. What year was that? <laughs> they don't like that. But anyway. And, uh, but folks, we've got so much more to be glad about because we became new citizens of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. When we came to Christ, that new life we have with it comes innumerable benefits, innumerable uh, ideas and concepts that if we don't read and study God's word, we won't understand the, the full benefits we have. I don't think we'll understand them until heaven. And I got a feeling after maybe 100 million years in heaven that maybe my mind will start grasping around the edges of that type of benefits we have. It'll be unbelievable. As a matter of fact, we said a few weeks ago, the Bible tells us, I has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has the mind of man comprehended the things God has for his, his, the ones he loves. And, and I think so often about it. The other night we were watching a, something. I don't know if we were at the farm or where we were, but we saw a big picture of the sky and the beautiful stars. And, and so often I think when I'm out there looking at that, six days, Pluto, Mars, Venus, the Earth, ribeye steak, horses, you name it, six days. He's been building a place for 2,000 years. He did this in six days. I can't wrap my head around if he did this in six days, what's he been doing for 2,000 years? Because when he left, he said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. I, ha I cannot imagine the grandeur of heaven that's waiting for us. And the Bible tells us you, we can't. It says your mind cannot conceive. You cannot fathom. If you've been to that Graceland and saw Elvis Presley's airplane that had the gold-handled faucet, he's like, gold, who puts gold on? Fa Do you know what? We, we call that pavement in heaven. <laughs> Yeah, the streets of gold. But anyway, so we got a, we, last week we talked about new life. Today we're talking about our new Lord. With this new life comes a new authority. When we gave our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, I said, Lord, forgive me a sinner, and I called him Lord. The Bible tells us, how shall we be saved? You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Many people believe Jesus is the Savior. Many People believe Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and rose again. The devil believes Jesus died on the cross and was buried and rose again. The devil doesn't call him Lord. The devil's not going to heaven. Jesus did not, is not going to bring Lucifer into the kingdom. He's been cast out and he will remain out. So it's not just an issue of consciously knowing these things. It's believing in our hearts that, God, that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures, was buried, and rose again according to the Scriptures. And we live our lives accordingly. Now, you might be saying, well, I, you don't have to say it. I'll say it. You know, you all have a pastor that still sins? Yeah, I sin. And I know it. And you know it. And I know you do because I know that we're sinners. But praise God, the story doesn't stop there. Because if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we're going to talk about this today. If you struggle with that, if you're like, I know I'm a believer. I know I've been set free from sin, but sin has not been set free for me. It still is in me. Here's how Paul put it. That which I want to do, I don't. 
That which I don't want to do, I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. What, how do we explain this? And so you might be struggling with that. And today, hopefully here in the next two or three hours, we'll go ahead and examine these. And <laughs> They had Uber Eats. Deacons locked the doors. <laughs> uh, and so we have a new Lord. And with this new Lord, there's some expectations. And he is correct in expecting us to do these things. It is our reasonable service. It's our expected service when we call him Lord. So I'm going to pick up in verse 14. We left off there last week. I'm going to pick up there. And uh, I just want to encourage you today. Listen to what it says here. With our new life, it says, for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law. You are under grace. Praise God, we're under grace. And then Paul, having spoken to many people by this time, by the time he wrote the book of Romans, he can understand when he gives the gospel message or giving theological insight, the questions that would come up. This would be foreign to the Jews of 2,000 years ago. As a matter of fact, it's foreign to a lot of Jews today. What do you mean we're not under the law? Moses has the law. Who's greater than Moses? There's one. His name's Jesus. That's who's greater than Moses. But Elijah said, guess what? There's one greater than Elijah. His name's Jesus. As a matter of fact, there's no name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. So it says here that uh, he says we're no longer under the law. The law doesn't apply to us. I said a few weeks ago, and I've said it many times, if I put a sign over there that says don't touch wet, this is wet paint, I would probably be the guy that would go over there and look around and make sure no one's looking and, touch, and then look at my I want to perceive it's wet paint. But the moment you tell me don't do something, I want to do it. Uh, and, so, and, and that's part of it. So the law actually carries a curse. And when it says, don't do this, how's this? Adam, Eve, do not eat of this tree. Eve looked at the tree. It was pleasant to her eye. It would make her wise. So she took of it and ate and gave her husband who was with her, and he ate also. Why did they eat? Because they were told not to. Every other tree in the garden they could have eaten from, but they wanted the one God said don't. And folks, that is part of our human condition. So we talked last week about a new life, and we're told here, do not let sin reign in your body. We have a new master. We have a new Lord. Sin and slave and death used to be our master. It said to do something, and we did it, and we had little to no possibility of not doing it. But Jesus said, I'm going to come inside, you start cleaning things up, and it's not going to be clean from the outside in, but from the inside out. So your heart has been declared, judicially declared by God the Father in heaven, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God has declared you justified. You will be treated as though you are righteous. And this is this duality in our mind says, well, thank you, God. I, I mean, really, thank you. But I know that. And so we struggle with this concept sometimes. So hopefully here, maybe just in the next 20 minutes or 30, I'll cut it down from three hours. Uh, hopefully in the next few minutes here, you'll, you'll kind of get an understanding of what's going on here and why we struggle with this even though we're saved. So Paul says then in verse 15, the Holy Spirit through Paul, I should say, the Holy Spirit through Paul then says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? So someone said, well, if we're not under the law, then that means Katie barred the door. I can go willy-nilly. I can live helter-skelter. I can live oingo-boingo. I can do what I want. Nobody cares. Those are words. <laughs> I've heard them before. So what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? And someone would think that. They said, well, well hold on a second. You mean, you know, I, I'm, old, I, I'm, I'm not under the law, so now I can do whatever I want. I can run and do whatever I feel and sow my wild oats. And the next thing he says, absolutely not. I saw this real clearly. They always say if you're a pastor's kid or wife, everything you ever say or do could be used in illustration. So my youngest daughter, Rachel, told me don't use her name, so I won't. But my youngest daughter, <laughs> she, we had a home that we owned, that we, a little rent house, and her and some friends when they graduated high school. We all want to move in together, and we're going to pay the bills and be adults. And I think she was 17. She got out of high school a little early, and we, uh, we, we, we allowed it. We permitted it. I wasn't a fan of it, but we permitted it. And um, she was working, and some other folks weren't. And she said, Dad, I'll go buy groceries, and I'll come home, and I'll try to get something to eat, or Cokes or chips, or all my food. They sit around and eat all my food. I go work all day, I buy the food, they come home, and they eat it. You don't know what that's like, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
No? <laughs> Been doing it for 17 years. <laughs> But this, this thing is, well, now I'm free. I'm on my own. I can do what I want. Hold it. You mean I got an adult? I thought I wanted the freedom, but I didn't want the adulting. Uh, but with freedom comes responsibility. And that's what our pastor tells us today. It says, well, if we're not under the law and we're under grace, does that mean we do what we want? No, you still have responsibility. Here's what Jesus said. My sheep hear my voice and they obey me. Well, can't we just love you? Yes, you better love Jesus. But he said, what I'm looking for, your, your love for me will be proven by your obedience to me. That's what Jesus is looking for. Do we have obedience to him? Now, I want to be very clear. Obedience to God's word is not salvation. Salvation, when Christ from the cross cried out, it is finished, our salvation was sealed by what Christ did for us. I may once saved, always saved. Unless we can somehow undo that Jesus died for my sins, was buried, and rose again. If we can undo that somehow, then I might, I might be in trouble. But as long as he was buried, that he died, and he rose again, and that's a historical fact. And that historical fact in time that happened way back there has present implications today. I am saved today, and I will always be saved from the penalty of sin. What's the penalty of sin? Death. I will never have spiritual death forever. It cannot be, I cannot lose it. It cannot be taken away. And the reason I can't lose it, nothing I did got it for, to me. It's what Jesus did. When Jesus goes in daily with the holy bread of the holy of holies, not built with human hands, but he goes and presents the Father, hey, today's Dale's sin, here's the blood for Dale's sin. He did it once and for all. And he goes to the holy of holies, he's my intercessor, he's my high priest, according to Hebrews. And he makes atonement for me 2,000 years ago, and that sacrifice was so strong, it'll last for. 100 bazillion Googleplex years and, pl and infinity and beyond. It'll never wear out. It was a perfect, incorruptible. Think, I think of that sometimes when it says you were not bought with corruptible things like silver and gold, but you were been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. How long does gold last before it starts corrupting? Billions of years? When we send stuff out in space, they use gold and they said it'll be... 100,000 years, it'll be as good as the day it left here. Gold, will, it doesn't corrupt. But here's what the Bible says about gold. It's corruptible. But the precious blood of Jesus is not. That's what bought us. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood can wash away our sins. And so, as knowing the people say, well, if we're not under the law, does that mean we can break the law? And Paul says, absolutely not by no means. Do you know that when you offer yourselves, boy, I wish it had different language there. Because when it says, do you not know that you offer yourselves, you mean that means willful. That means my will. When you offer yourselves. When you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey. When Satan comes along and says, do this, do that, say this, say that, and we know it's a sin and we do it, the devil didn't make me do it. I offered myself. We offer ourselves to sin. If you're a believer, you have discernment and you know better. And there's, there's everyone in this room can probably look back at a point in their life after salvation and said, you know, I knew for a fact that was wrong and I did it anyway. That's willful sin. That, that's a hard one to overcome. It says here that you offered yourselves, whoever you offer yourself to become obedient slaves to, you are slaves of the one you obey. Why do we listen to Satan? I know we've got some new people here, Danny, so they won't mind hearing this story if Danny's still in here. One time on the Latani River, I remember there was a group of shepherds there, and they mixed all their sheep up, and they were down in the valley, having by the, the great Latani, this from me to this, this stand here, the great Latani. It's going down through the middle of Lebanon. And I remember these shepherds down there by the grass, and they were feeding it. I said, when you guys split up, how do you know? And they said, oh... These were Islamic, you know, shepherds. And the one comes over here and he yells, some a bunch of sheep come over. It's like an anthill and this guy goes that way. And they, I said, you need to count them? Nope. Don't need to count them. Why do you not need to count them? My sheep hear my voice and they know me. They won't follow another. Folks, why do we? We know the voice of our shepherd. What in the world are we doing listening to the voice of someone else? And, and folks, it made me realize I'm dumber than a sheep in Lebanon. <laughs> sheep won't do that. Your pastor will. 
We're getting a new personnel committee this afternoon for me this afternoon. <laughs> Folks, we listen to a, to, a, to a voice that we should run from. We should resist the devil. Turn to God. Resist the devil and the devil will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. If God's right next to you in the spiritual realm and he's here all the time, you think the devil wants to hang around you when you're standing there next to Jesus? If you draw near to God, the devil will leave you. But our problem is somebody, hey, Jesus, just hang out over there for a little bit. I want to go back to my old, my, my peoples over here. I want to hang out with this group. Folks, the devil is not our, our master. He's not our shepherd. When he speaks, we should run away. So it says here uh, that when you offer yourselves, when you willfully, when you offer yourselves to someone who's obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey. Whether you're slaves to sin, which leads to death. We said a moment ago, where does sin lead? Wages of sin is death. We're going to get that here at the closing verse of this chapter. Verse 23 kind of sums it up. Sin leads to death. Uh, or, to, or if we offer ourselves to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Sin leads to death. Obedience leads to righteousness. Which do you want? Here's the test. Remember I said this a few weeks ago. God gave us a test back in Deuteronomy. I put before you this day life and death. Choose life. Anyone taking a test? And the teacher says, here's the answer sheet. Usually not. God did. I put before you today life and death. Which one are you going to choose? By the way, I'm encouraging you to choose life. Here's the answer. Choose life. Why do we go around choosing death? Why do we go back up and pick up that sin that we laid down at the cross so many years ago or last week or yesterday? And we go pick it up and we wallow around in it and we're there with the pigs in the, in the trough and we know we have a father that has food and clothes and a house and a mansion waiting for us. And we do it over and over and over and again. I am so thankful that I have a God that's the God of infinite chances. Growing up, God's a God of second chances. If it was second, I would be of all men most miserable. I need a God that's the God of infinite forgiveness. Praise God. That's who I serve. And as a matter of fact, the very next verse tells us that it starts out. But thanks be to God. Verse 17, but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, we were slaves. The devil would say, do something, we did it. I suspect people in here today could give testimony. We're not going to today, but they could give testimony. You know, before Christ, I did this, this, and this, and this, and I'm ashamed of it. I used to love that. I used to take pride in that. I used to, man, this is who I am. My identity was wrapped up in this. People knew me for this. But that's no longer. Jesus showed up. Everywhere I look in this Bible where Jesus showed up, things got better. Nowhere do I read, and Jesus showed up in the town and everything got worse. It doesn't say that. I know when he showed up in my life, things got better. I know when he showed up in the life of my grandfather, who was an alcoholic, I know in my own personal family, things got better. They got way better. I've taken my kids, my unsaved grandfather, my dad was a believer, he was a believer, my dad is a believer, I'm a believer in my kids. In four generations, I've taken my kids where I grew up and they're shocked. This is how you, that's how I lived. That was my house. And they're like, I, I can't believe that. that that's, I said, it's a foreign concept to you. That's not because grandpa or dad or me or mom or anyone was great. It's because God has blessed us. God says, I will be bl blessful and I will mer uh, give mercy and compassion and blessings generation upon generation upon generation. And if you say, well, you know, uh, I, I, that's not my family, then you start it. You start saying, I want my kids and my grandkids and my great-grandkids to have the blessings of God. I've got to take a stand and I've got to take a stand today. I said last week, people say, well, I'm from a dysfunctional family. I do a lot of prison work. I'm a dysfunctional family. If you're from the family of Adam and Eve, so am I. Everyone in that family, if you're from the family of Adam and Eve, you're in a dysfunctional family. Husbands and wives don't get along. Parents and kids don't get along. In-laws and outlaws and ex-laws. And they fight and they bicker and they complain. And we don't get along right. We don't act perfectly like God wants us to act. We all miss the mark. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God is what I'm told. That's all of us. And so when people say today, well, I'm, I was born this way, and that's why you must be born again. We were all born sinners, addicted to sin. Whatever it is, we can list the endless list of sins. It doesn't matter. You broke one, you broke them all. And Jesus shows up and says, you must be born again. Praise God that although we used to be slaves to sin, that's not the story today. This is my story. This is my song. You've come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching 
that has now claimed your allegiance. Prior to Christ, their pattern of teaching was the law. They were obedient to the law. The pattern of teaching was, we're going to follow what the law says. But praise be to God, that form of teaching, the Mosaic law, but now as saints, we live to obey a Christian form of teaching called God's grace. They followed God's law. That was their form of teaching. We've come to a, a better teaching, a much better teaching. How do you like this? You sin, you die. You sin, you're taken outside, you're stoned to death. You sin, you're, you're beaten, you're whipped. Who likes that? How's this? You're sinned, Jesus says, I forgive you. Everyone remember the three greatest statements in every culture in the history of the world? I love you, I forgive you, dinner is served. What's the story of the Bible? I love you, I forgive you, this is my body which is broken for you, take and eat. We've got the greatest message in the, in the, in the world. We just have to speak it. We have a God that speaks, Genesis 1, and God said, 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 and God said. Should his people be people that speak? Ephesians 4.15, speak the truth in love, that's in the command. We're supposed to speak the truth. Where there is no divine revelation, the people perish. Do you feel like you're perishing in the world we live in today? This world is turned upside down. I think Dorothy said that in Sunday school today, in Bible study. She says, this world feels like it's turned upside down, and it has. Because there's no divine revelation in our world and in our culture. Praise God, you've learned a different pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. I would never want to go back to the law. I'm so glad I'm under grace. You have been set free from sin, and you have become slaves to righteousness. Now, Paul here in verse 19 says, I'm going to use an example from everyday life. So a lot of times Jesus spoke with parables. I do believe there's a lot of power in stories. Every little kid in the world tells mom or dad when they're a kid, going to bed, mommy, daddy, tell me a story. Who controls the narrative, I think, controls a lot of culture. When Jesus said, don't eat of the tree, and Satan came along and said, did God really say? Those are the two competing narratives in the world. Did God say it or did God not? And if God said it, that settles it. I, again, that's another one of those things I grew up as a kid. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. You believing it has no bearing on it being accurate. God said it, that settles it. Did anyone, hear, did anyone heard that saying when you were a kid growing up? God said it, I believe it, that settles it. It's like that little part that said it doesn't need to be there. Your believing has no bearing. Yeah. It's kind of, I looked at this, I was trying to think of a story when, when Paul says here, I'm using earthly things. I was thinking, you know, many years ago I had a nationwide insurance agency. I was the agent primary in it. And I remember, and I said this last week too, we kind of are in a world where, where salvation was by Christ. If a pipe in your home breaks and you get your mop and your squeegees and your buckets and you start getting the water out, how long are you going to keep fighting that water before you just said, you know what, I better go turn the water off? Would it be smart to turn the water off? Well, that's what Christ did for us at salvation. The power, the conduit, that we had the connection we had to sin. We were slaves to sin. Christ broke that chain and said, you are no longer slaves to sin. That's been broken. I turned the water off. The power that was ruining your and destroying your life and your family I have broken that power. It no longer reigns over you. Do not let sin reign in your life. Amen. But after that flood and after you turn the water off, is there a mess? Is the mess instantly cleaned or is there some work involved? Pull up the carpet, throw out the, maybe some clothes, throw out some furniture. You've got to start cleaning. And we've got to pick up all that rotten, moldy, nasty. Remember the flood waters here a few years ago. How silly would it be if someone in there, you're going, what are you doing? I'm squeezing the water out. The water's five foot deep in this room. Yeah, I'm squeezing it out. That's what the law does. Is you, you, you can't squeegee out the water. You got five foot of water. Your home's up to my chin in water in this room. You're not going to squeegee the water. I'm going to try real hard. That's the law. We needed someone to say, I got to get the water lowered, and then I start getting the water, and then I start replacing. That's sanctification. This is the process we're in now. We got to pick up all that old Nasty, stinking, rotten carpet, clothes, furniture, garbage, whatever, and throw it out and bring in the new stuff. Quit being slaves to sin and start being slaves to righteousness. Would it be absolutely ridiculous to 
have your whole house redone, new carpet, new furniture, say, but man, I really like that chair. It was all moldy and rotten and rat infested. And well, I'm going to go to the dump and get it back and bring it back in here. It's laughable, right? Do, is that something called sin that we do sometimes? Has, do we, have we thrown out sin that sometimes we go back to it and we bring it back in our life and it's like that's garbage. That's stinking, rotten, disgusting, vile, offensive to God. And why are you bringing it back in your house? Why are you, bringing that, why are you letting that sin run back through your world? Well, it says here we're not slaves to sin anymore. We can say no. We don't have to go out to the garbage and bring it back in. So salvation is God. He turned the water off. It no longer has power. So we're no longer under the penalty of sin, death. We're no longer under the power of sin. We can say no. So that's the little example I give there. I'm, I, Paul says I'm using an example from everyday life because of your hu human limitations. It's hard for us to see that with sin. We see it pretty easy with that water situation. We've, some of us have lived through that. So we say, yeah, it would be silly to try to get the water out of the house when it's five feet underwater. And once we get the water out, it would be silly to bring in rotten stuff back in, but we do. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, that, which leads to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. In Isaiah, it tells us, Isaiah 64, 6, all your righteousness is as filthy rags. So it says, when you were a sinner, you did zero righteousness. Now that you're righteous, how much sin should you be doing? Should be zero. But it's not. That's why we're still struggling. What's the term we use often? If the perfect Christian, it's in the Bible, what's the term? Absent from the flesh. That's a perfect Christian. As long as we're in the flesh, we're not perfect. Till that day comes, we're struggling. And we, we have to say, Lord, forgive me, I sinned another day. I sinned again today. Forgive me. We've got to confess every day. When you were slaves, you did no righteousness, and the, and you, the uh, control of righteousness was not over you. Verse 21. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things that you were now ashamed of? I've never met an alcoholic that said, boy, I'm so glad I was an alcoholic. I'm so glad I was a drug addict. I'm so glad I was whatever the sin was. I'm so glad I had a wicked, evil mouth that's cursed all the time. I'm so glad I had hatred in my heart. I've never heard that. No one's ever been, it's always saying, back when you were back there before Christ, are you proud of that? Or are you ashamed of it now? I'm kind of ashamed of it. Many of us might in here say, there's some chapters of my life I'd be pretty ashamed if everyone knew about. If this was the story of my life and you took a page out and read it, oh, Pastor Dale, I can't believe you did that. You, maybe you're in that situation. Well, thank goodness, that's no longer my charge. Jesus took that. He forgave all my sins, past, present, and future. So it says, what benefit was, was there to you when you were doing the things you're not ashamed of? Those things resulted in death. Families fall apart. Lives fall apart. Sometimes, God, sometimes we die, some of the stuff people do. It, it literally kills people. But now, verse uh, 22, it switches gears. It says, but now that you've been set free from sin, the power of sin is no longer over us, and you become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. And then to sum all this up, it says, for the wages, the earned results, the deserved results of your sin, the wages of sin is death. You got what you deserved. But the gift, the grace, the mercy, the things you do not deserve, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wages says, you, you, you ended up that situation, what do you, what do you expect is going to happen? What would you think was going to happen with doing that? If you hit your thumb with a hammer, don't be shocked if it hurts. Why would you think something else is going to happen? Well, I just didn't think it would apply to me. Well, the Bible says right here that if you do this, there's, there's trouble comes from that life. Well, I, I, I didn't know it applied to me. I want to jump off the building and fly. Well, if you jump off, you're going to fall down and break your leg. Well, I, I jumped off and broke my leg. I, I, I didn't know gravity applied to me. I don't believe in gravity. You hear that? I don't believe in God. That doesn't apply to me. God said it. That settles it. 
our struggle we have is this confusion that there's two kingdoms. Jesus said, be in the world, but not of the world. We are citizens of another kingdom. We're still in this world, though, and that's where a lot of our disconnect comes from. It's like, well, man, it's great to hear about all these rewards and benefits and blessings that I just read about, and man, I believe it, but man, I don't feel it. And, that, and the problem is we're in two different kingdoms. We operate spiritually. We are citizens of heaven. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. God is our Father. We're not of this world, but we're still in it. And there's the rub. I was thinking of a story. I briefly, real briefly with Dwight today. Dwight, U.S. Marine Corps. Thank you very much for your service, Dwight. Uh, I was thinking about back in World War II, Operation Birdcage. I don't know if you looked this up. I was doing some reading a few weeks ago and came across this. And it said, uh, I know what it was, August 15th, just a few days ago. August 15th is VJ Day, Victory Over Japan. I know you kids are like, I never heard of that. They don't teach it anymore. But Victory Over Japan was August 15th, 1945. It's the day U.S. troops defeated the emperor in Japan. They dropped the bomb and Japan surrendered. Victory Over Japan Day. And they had almost 30,000 POWs scattered all over Asia between China and Japan in prison camps. And Operation Birdcage, they started dropping leaflets to the uh, soldiers. They'd look for these prison camps and try to find them and say, we've won. The U.S. has won. Help is coming. And they said, uh, they dropped leaflets to Operation Birdcage. They said, stay where you are so the supplies can get to you. If we have 30,000 people start moving all over the Middle East, we'll never find it. We need you to stay together. And it was called Operation Birdcage. Stay where you are. Sit tight. Help's coming. Do you feel like that's what God told us as Christians? Be in the world, but not of the world. Stay where you are, sit tight, blessings are coming. I hope rain's coming, but blessings are coming. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. God will give us these things. Open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing you cannot re uh, receive. My cup runneth over. All these things in the Bible, God has basically dropped a leaflet called the Bible and said, help's coming. Sit tight, hold on, stand strong. Having done all to stand, stand. You'll get through this. Now, those Japanese, one guy, I looked him up, I was doing some reading, and it said, uh, the United States Marine Corps Private Lionel Berthoud, they brought him home, got him on the scale, 80 pounds. He weighed 80 pounds when they got him home from Japan. They were starving him to death. Uh, you might feel like that. You might say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Do you think they were happy, those prisoners, when they got these leaflets that said, America won, help's coming? Do you think they, re I think they rejoiced. The war's over. This one guy, uh, Rufus Austin, he went in at 17 years of age. He was caught on Wake Island. He did his 18th, 19th, 20, 21 birthday in a POW camp. He got the leaflet that said, help's coming. He said, it's great to be an American. We've won. 17-year-old kid, four years of his life, 44 months in a, a Japanese POW camp. I tell you these stories because emotionally they move us, but more so than the physical, help's coming. They, after Operation uh, Birdcage, they did Operation Swift Mercy. And they started dropping. You ever see the movie Unbroken, Louis Zamperini at the end? The parachutes came down with all the supplies and food and canned goods. And th that Operation uh, Swift Mercy, they said, we're going to start dropping supplies all over. Nine million pounds, 45,000 tons of foods were dropped over that area by U.S. military planes. Those military planes that used to scare them to death. The prisoner would say, oh, they may shoot us. They don't know that we're POWs. Now it's like those are blessings of mercy coming. There was once a God that was mad at us and we were under his judgment. Now he's nothing but mercies from him. Nine million pounds of food were dropped on the, on the prisoners in, um, in Operation Swift Mercy. And I was thinking about that thinking, Operation Birdcage, just sit tight, stay where you are till we get you. Isn't that kind of what we're waiting on? Operation Swift Mercy, helps coming. Here's, the, here's some early blood. Here's some, you know we have the gift of the Holy Spirit already as down payment of our inheritance? The Bible tells us that. It says you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. The down payment of everything that's coming, the down payment's already there. Now these prisoners for about 30 days, it took almost 30 days, over a month, a little bit over a month to get a, the vast majority of them back home. I get a feeling that 30-day window when they got the piece of paper that said helps on the way, day 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, in that window, people were still starving to death. I could see the POW saying, well, it doesn't feel like we've been saved. It doesn't feel like it yet. That's where we are. So you say, I believe it. When they read that leaflet, America won, they believed it, but they said, we don't feel it. 
Maybe that's how we are as Christians. But folks, help is on the way. I read in Matthew 25 the other day, it says when Jesus comes back, if you put it all together, I'm looking for the day when the heavens open up and the Lord himself will descend with a shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. In Thessalonians, then we jump over to Matthew 25, it says he will come with all his holy angels. How many angels are there? I know Revelation says myriads times myriads times myriads. 10,000 times 10,000 times that. There's no, they're innumerable. Here's what Matthew says. I'm coming back with all my holy angels. Help's coming. Help's on the way. We're not battling for victory. We're battling the devil from victory. Christ has already won. The grave is defeated. The power of sin is no more. We need to walk in the light as he is in the light. As a brother T today mentioned, we don't have a spirit of fear. We have a spirit of power and of self-control and of love. That's the spirit we walk in. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this message today. Father, embolden us as Christians to speak the truth and love. Let us reach those that are lost. I pray for those around the world today in whatever capacities they're in that are taking stands and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no other message more important than the message of Christ, what he's done for mankind. Father, I ask you to uh, let someone today that may be watching this at home or maybe here in the future might come to just, just cry out such a simple prayer, Dear God, forgive me a sinner. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. That quickly, something that simple said from the heart, they join your family today. Father, I ask this, this next few moments of our time of invitation that, uh, Father, you just send your spirit. If you're working on someone, Father, they can walk an aisle, maybe join our church, maybe ask for baptism or salvation. Father, whatever you're asking them to do, Father, I just ask you and give them the strength and the courage to step out and do what you're speaking them to do right now. Uh, we ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.